The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is supported in part by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, conserving the wild things and wild places of Texas thanks to members across the state. Additional funding is provided by Toyota. Your local Toyota dealers are proud to support outdoor recreation and conservation in Texas. Toyota, let's go places. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. We lose up to one billion birds a year in the United States alone, just from collisions. The lake is historic, the town is historic, but they also come for the landscape. We make these visitor orientation panels and they have the big red arrow on them. You are here. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. Good morning, Dallas. We have a warm spring day in store. Clouds clearing by new time. It's 74 degrees at 6 o'clock. Quick huddle up, just real fast. One, two, three. Each spring and fall, before sunrise, a group of volunteers flocks to a Dallas parking lot. Just be really careful as we're crossing the roads. We'll divide the route in half and then we'll meet in the center. They're here to survey downtown buildings. If we find any sunbirds, we've got some canisters. But their interest is birds. Sound good? Okay, let's do it. It'll be just a lot of walking for a while. It's not. <laughs> These volunteers are gathering valuable data about the impacts of city lights and buildings on migrating birds. Anything? Blue jay? Okay, we've got a blue jay chick. Uh, thankfully, this isn't a collision issue. That, that's just a little fledgling that's come out of the nest. And I saw its mom right back here, so uh, we'll let it be and she'll keep feeding it there on the ground. We're headed out on a bird collision survey through downtown Dallas, looking to see if we find any birds that have hit buildings that have been drawn down by artificial light. We're gonna document those birds and put them into a database for science. This is an important conservation issue. We lose up to one billion birds a year in the United States alone, just from collisions. So we have to take action on it. Many bird species are in dramatic decline because of loss of habitat and other issues. And so to take action on this issue is really important to save these birds. Okay. So it's great to have a good crew out here every morning that's trying to help out, get the city darker and then document the collisions that we're finding so we know what's going on out there and we can do something about it. A lot of times the strike zone will have planters, you know. It's difficult to find a bird in something like this, but if they're brightly colored, you know, sometimes we can see them. So we're two buildings down and zero collisions so far that we've documented. It's the only bird walk where you don't want to find any birds. We get a lot of banana peels, door stops, dog poo. You, you, with eyes like this, we can make anything into a bird. The other day, my youngest son looks down, and there was a hummingbird laying at the bottom of the fence. He said, what about this one? <laughs> Sometimes kids uh, have the best yeah. eyes. <laughs> A lot of people don't realize that there are birds migrating at night. It's a big migration zone for birds passing both in the spring and the fall. If you think about before all these lights, you have birds probably navigating by the constellations and the moon. Birds at night just can't help themselves but come down into the city and then they get confused by all the glass. They see these trees reflected in the buildings, especially mirrored glass, and fly into the glass thinking that they're landing in a tree. 
and unfortunately they're doing it 35 oh. miles an hour, so it's, it's not yeah. a, a gentle strike usually. Yeah, what do you think? So it looks like we have a Nashville warbler. We have the yellow on the breast and then um, its size gives it away that's a warbler. And then we have an olive green on the back wings and on its back. And so Alfonso and I are gonna bag it. At least we're finding and documenting the collision and we're gonna be able to use that data to help make additional change in the city and prevent collisions. On to look for more. It may seem like it's just one bird, but it all adds up. So this is a brown thrasher, one of the larger birds that we find aside from the waterfowl. This one's been here a little bit longer. It's an area we don't always come down to search along the skywalk. If you think about the loss of one bird, you've lost that bird, and then every bird it would have produced that year and the following year, and its offspring. And there's another. Older bird, but it looks like maybe a blue grosbeak. Yeah. Blue grosbeak. Some of the songbirds might have five nests here and six young in each nest, and that adds up to like 340 some birds just from the loss of that one bird. It's pretty sad in the moment. Um, you just kind of have to tell yourself that you're doing this to collect data and, you know, get these buildings to turn off their lights at night and prevent more collisions from happening. Anything in the 10 building study, the data goes to Cornell, but all of the birds go to A&M. So they're all getting used instead of discarded. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So once those legs are out and you have it peeled down just a little bit, mm -hmm. you can go ahead and do that. We're in the Biodiversity Research and Teaching Collection. Uh, we have collections of birds, mammals, reptiles and amphibians and fishes. We've got approaching 1.2 million specimens collectively. Specifically to birds, we're about to hit 30,000 specimens. I would say that the bulk of our material uh, comes in from uh, salvage programs. When specimens arrive here from the Lights Out program, they're frozen with their data and we put them into baskets according to where they came from and kind of prioritize processing them into specimens for our collection. Most recently, with, this, uh, with the Lights Out program, we've started to get hundreds and hundreds of birds after each migratory period. So a couple hundred in the fall and a couple hundred in the spring. These are warbler specimens. Most of them came from a major fallout event in 2017 in Galveston. And uh, 400 or so hit a building in the middle of the night because the building's lights were on. That kind of started our awareness program in Texas. Um, it made national news. From there, uh, kind of our volunteer efforts across the state started uh, with awareness of lights off at night, you know, when migration is happening specifically. These are our 12 most common um, window strike species that we get from Lights Out, and it spans more than just the songbirds. I am working on a yellow-breasted chat. It's a salvage bird that hit a building in Dallas. When the birds come here, we can then use them for all sorts of different research projects. People will uh, often ask for loans of tissue material to do genetic research. We can pull from here for them to do DNA analysis on those specimens. Some people are interested in disease ecology and they've asked for tissues to look at zoonotic diseases. We teach labs here in the collections, so it's not just research, it's, it's also teaching and trying to develop that next generation of ecologists and conservation biologists. And that's one of the big lights out birds. We try to maximize each specimen. We, we want to make sure that they're used. Wow, that's the first one. Where was he? This one was across the street over here, the big glass there by that building. An oven bird? You're in the warbler family? Large yeah. warbler. The species is just known to strike glass a lot. Somebody came up with the term super collider. We're trying to help prevent these kind of collisions. And hopefully with the data that we find here, with the birds that we're able to find, we're able to bring more awareness. It's worth it, you know, at the end of the day, Everybody who's here loves wildlife, and we're all doing this for a good cause, to be able to help these birds make it safely home. Today we're gonna break 200 birds so far this season. It just really breaks my heart, makes me sad. We can do better. All right. It's 
becoming a bigger and bigger topic. More people are starting to pay attention to it, try to figure out what they can do to change glass and also change lighting. Texas is a globally important bird area, so when we take lights out action here, it has an exponential effect across the country. It's important to take action at home as well, and our communities really rallied around this to help save birds. As you can see, it's been, unfortunately, a busy season. Uh, freezer is pretty full. Uh, six, seven deceased birds and one stunned bird, which we'll take and release. We get quite a few each season that are stunned or injured that we can release back into the wild. The best part is being able to save what birds we can. It's very rewarding when you can just remove them away from the glass and let them go off on their own and do their thing again. Celebrating a century of Texas State Parks. It is uh, very, very unique for this part of Texas. This is such a special and outstanding place around the lake. They wanted to do something with it. West of Fort Worth are a park and lake named for a town built on water. This was the surface water, drinking water, for the town of Mineral Wells. Mineral Wells came about because of the mineral water. That water put this place on the map. The history of the town started with Mr. Lynch. One of the first settlers that moved here drilled some wells and noticed that the water tasted a little weird. And after a while, they noticed that their rheumatoid arthritis and some other ailments just disappeared. Back in the day, most people didn't have pharmaceuticals. So they thought it had to be something in the water. Anything that would help them feel better, and mineral water did, they would come to it. And they came to it in droves until it became a town and therefore mineral well. And it turned out it's chock full of minerals and something called lithium, and that's why they mentally felt better, so they thought it cured the crazies. Once everyone found out about the crazy water, people came to bathe in it and drink it and swim in it. The healing waters are different today, but visitors still come to mineral wells to recharge. They come here to enjoy the water, but uh, the water is uh, in a lake form now. And for those who don't want to relax, active entertainment abounds. Good. They come from the rock climbing. I gotcha. Road bicyclists ride in the paved roads, enjoy the scenery at the park. You can go hiking, you can horseback ride, you can go mountain biking. We do have multifaceted trails. A lot of people come out with their own boats and kayaks, but there is an opportunity to rent those. Enjoy your time out there. There's just so much variety. I mean, you can come here for the weekend and you're not going to get bored. There's plenty to do. All right, we're riding. There you go. We have about 12 miles of trail here located in the state park. Uh, most of those are in our what we call our backcountry area. 45 minute drive from Fort Worth and you go from, you know, big city population down to just unadulterated country. You've got some flat, uh, you've got some downhills, you've got some technicals. There's something out here for every experience level. It's absolutely gorgeous. And the park offers another kind of trail to travel. <laughs> Great example of a Rails of Trails program. 20 miles of protected pathway link the park to Mineral Wells and Weatherford. 250 to 300 years old. That's how old this tree is. We really want people to enjoy it and learn about the cross timbers. We're gonna go walk down by the lake now. And so we offer guided hikes. Watch your step. We feel like if they understand it, then they will appreciate it. About to go into Penitentiary Hollow. And when you appreciate something, you're gonna help us protect it. Let's go in. We try to make people fall in love with the place.
people have come for centuries for the healing water in Mineral Wells. You know, even though uh, the lake is not the crazy water, having that moment of peace and seeing that beautiful sunset, getting out in nature itself is therapeutic. The universe is amazing, the sky is amazing, and seeing the stars as beautiful as they are in the Milky Way with your naked eye and then being able to photograph it, it's just, it's mind-blowing and it's addicting. You can't see anything like this in most parts of the state, in most parts of the country. I would much rather be in a, in a park somewhere in the mountains or hiking or exploring than sitting in traffic. We're out here because it is one of the, if not the darkest sky in the lower continental 48 with a workshop group who have all signed up to come out here and learn how to photograph the night sky. I come out a day early. I come out and scout out locations to make sure that, you know, I know where the Milky Way is gonna be rising so I can get them a good shot. And not run over this little road runner here. If we were here and there's, you know, a giant light right here, obviously that's not gonna work for our shot. But it looks like it's gonna work out pretty nicely because, you know, it's no light here. Terling was back here, that'll be minimal light. Really kind of stoked about this one. And I haven't shot it yet, so it'll be really fun. Some of these students are brand spanking new into photography and you know they're just now learning how to turn on their camera. Some have gone from the film days and now they come to digital and they want to learn how to shoot digitally. You know, my goal for you guys is not only to learn but to walk away with at least one shot from this trip that you're like, I want to go and print this and hang this up my wall. And if you get that one shot, that's a good weekend. You know, I've been on trips for a week where I've gone out. Sunset approaches, I take them out to our first area to shoot at. Introduce them to their subjects, show them ideas for compositions, show them, you know, where the Milky Way and the stars will be. Um, the lower the better, Milky Way comes up right here. It's a really, really nice composition. And then as we go from, you know, sunset to twilight, they start getting a few hints of the stars above and then about a half after sunset, they get a full blown view of the Milky Way. And uh, we spend the next five, six hours out here shooting. It's really cool bringing students out here because many of them don't get to see the stars like this. They're stuck in cities, which, you know, they see three or four stars and they think, you know, oh my gosh, this is incredible. And when they come out here, their minds are absolutely blown because they can just see the night sky as beautiful as it is. And once they get shooting, all I ask is no red lights, no cell phones, no lights at all. That's going to make the whole process go much faster. And I teach them how to light paint their subjects, how to expose for the Milky Way, how to focus on it, and really how to take something that is absolutely majestic in the sky and tell a story with it. That bush is that the light's on. Really? Yep. So you're going to cover basically almost 180 degrees. You could simply walk outside, take a picture of the Milky Way in the sky, but I try to you know, figure out a way to tie that in with you know, a human interest. It's cool to incorporate it something as simple as you know, a cactus or a, a person or a building or uh, an old abandoned car. You know, telling a story of, okay, here's this town that's you know, 100, 200 years old. You have a, a city that has come and gone, but yet it still has the same night sky as it did when it was booming. It's luck as well as skill and patience and practice and experience. It's moments like that that make you work for the shot, that make that final shot when you do get that beautiful Milky Way so, so worth every ounce of effort that you put forth. So the best possible thing is for a visitor to be able to have a one-on-one -on -one experience with someone with deep knowledge of the park. And it can create the most meaningful connection. 
Unfortunately, it's not always possible for there to be people with deep knowledge everywhere in the park. And that's where we come in. We are the exhibits shop. So there are nine of us that, uh, that service 89 parks um, and we run typically 50 to 70 projects per year. They range in size from a handful of signs all the way up to a large visitor center or nature center and everything in between. We make these other signs visitor orientation panels, VOPs, and they have the big red arrow on them. You are here. So that's, that's the running joke. And then, and then my, my brother-in-law said, we'd be lost without you. What we can do is to uh, tell the story of the people who built the walls. I supervise three teams. Um, we have the interpretive planners uh, who research and write content uh, for our projects and also project manage those projects. We identify interpretive themes. We write content, find pictures, research, uh, background. And then I have a team of graphic designers um, and they do all the design work. The photograph that I was told about that they wanted to put in from the Austin History Center. It's really fun to bring an idea to life. And then I have a team of fabricators and installers that make exhibits, interior exhibits, exterior exhibits, furniture, and they also drive all over Texas and dig the holes and put the things in the ground. Over the 14 years that I've been here, um, we have put literally thousands of signs out in parks. Um, and most of those signs each have two holes. Um, and uh, if you've ever dug a hole in Texas, you know that it is serious business. Of those, um, you know, probably 10,000 holes that we have put in Texas, Tom has probably uh, dug 9,000 of them. And he has been to every single park at least twice. <laughs> yes, I have. At least twice. At least twice. Um, he's put more miles on uh, vehicles than most of us combined. Everyone is super creative, um, and we bring all those uh, skills and labor together um, to, to make whatever we think is gonna serve the stories of the park the best. Cool. So we take that job really seriously. And some topics are more challenging to talk about than others. One of the very special things about McKinney as a park is that it has some very sensitive history. Part of the history here is enslavement. Uh, Thomas McKinney is a, a well-known you know, Texas pioneer and like many of his contemporaries, was an ardent slave owner. We're just trying to give facts about a space. And sometimes it's not the best of news. It isn't the, it isn't the prettiest story. We try to tell the stories of, that are, relate to all Texans. Telling the stories of, of enslaved people, of segregation, other sorts of difficult topics that, that were uh, maybe at one time in the past more avoided. Uh, we try to take those head on when they're appropriate in our, in our parks. We're all an equal part in this story. And I think excluding some stories and lifting up other stories doesn't do a great service to our state and to the legacy of Texas that I think we're all really proud of. Having that ability because of what we do is phenomenal. What a, what a, we're so lucky that we get to do that. And so we are in a very privileged position to be able to be so central to the mission of Texas Parks and Wildlife in connecting people to the resources. Connecting people to the park, to the land, the animals, the plants, the history is really what it's all about for us. Telling those stories and helping more people learn them, at least until we can get back to the park and, and tell another one.
This series is supported in part by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, conserving the wild things and wild places of Texas thanks to members across the state. Additional funding is provided by Toyota. Your local Toyota dealers are proud to support outdoor recreation and conservation in Texas. Toyota, let's go places.